Welcome back to Module 2. This is the second lecture video for Phases of the Moon, um, and there is also a deeper look video that I recorded um, several months before right now, um, behind the scenes magic, uh, and it kind of fits both before this video and after this video. So in the YouTube playlist, I've put it before this one, uh, but you may want to revisit it after this lecture video. It might be helpful. Okay. So let's go back to the same kind of question we had asked ourselves at the beginning of the previous video and see if we feel any more comfortable with it. After this video, we'll hopefully get to the point where things are making a lot more sense um, and we've gotten rid of any misconceptions that we have about moon phases. So pause the video and think through this um, question and options. Okay. So... Just like before, option one here is the most common incorrect answer. It is not number one. Um, and if you've chosen that again, I really do need you to recognize that while it isn't something that you need to feel personally bad about, you do need to recognize that that is getting in the way of you being able to understand this topic. Um, so it may be worth um, watching that deeper look video first before we get any further along in this one, if you haven't yet, uh, and certainly making a note to double check your understanding after working with the material a little bit more. Option two here is the correct answer here. So option two is the correct one, where the moon is always half lit up by the sun, and if we were in a spaceship able to go around it, we would be able to see it was half lit up, but because we are stuck here on the ground on Earth, we only see part of that lit up half at any given time during its orbit, during a month. Okay, option three is not correct, uh, but some people replace that uh, with it, their misconception. So if it's not Earth's shadow, then somehow it's um, still based on how Earth lights it up. Uh, and option four, hopefully we threw out right away. Uh, we know that we live in Michigan and that clouds are almost impossible to predict ahead of time, and yet we can make a moon calendar for years in advance. Uh, so it certainly can't be something based on a cloud cover, which is so hard to predict. Okay, so all of the terms that we need to build into our vocabulary for this topic are listed on the left of our slide here. As always, I do need us to recognize the difference between memorizing terms for the sake of memorizing them and putting new words in our, into our vocabulary so that we can think critically and discuss at, in detail new topics. And this is a situation where we really do need to understand these words in order to talk about moon phases. So the picture here on the slide is one that after this video and the deeper look video where I'm drawing on a light board, we should better understand how the inner circle is showing the from space view and the outer circle is showing from the ground on Earth's point of view. So we'll, we'll revisit this at the end of the video and hopefully you'll think to yourself that does make more sense um, and you have a better understanding of where it comes from. Now, throughout seeing some of these uh, new diagrams and commenting on the multiple choice question a couple of times, we have started to talk about why the moon has phases, but what we also need to be building into our understanding is the order and length of those phases so that we can better actually see the moon in the sky and know what it is we're looking at and what's going to happen next. So the terms waxing and waning don't have to do with the shape of the moon, but they have to do with how the shape will be changing from our point of view. Waxing becomes means becoming progressively more visibly illuminated. To wax poetic, you kind of go on and on. Uh, and waning, becoming progressively less visibly illuminated, if your interest in a topic wanes, then it's getting less. Um, those terms can be used in other circumstances, but the most common use is in moon phases. There are two different websites that I have found that can be useful if you want to simulate and click on things and 
and see in a better sense all of these different moon phases in order. So certainly explore those on your own time after this lecture video, but I want to make sure to point them out right away. So in this image here, it's a little bit different than the view that we've had um, in other images. We've got the sunshine coming in from the top of the page instead of from the right side of the page. This image is showing where the moon is at all points in its orbit around the Earth where that orbit is being traced out with a little red dashed or uh, dotted line. And this is able to point out a couple of key things. The um, dashed line that goes from the Earth to the moon starts at new moon. And we see that in order to get back to new moon, we actually have to go a little bit further than a full circle. This is something that we actually explored earlier in the chapter in this module with the idea of a solar day and a sidereal day and how they're different by four minutes because the earth is moving around the sun as it also spins. It's the same kind of thing with moon phases. Solar month is the important one. It's also called the synodic period where it's new moon to new moon. What I need us to recognize is we don't need to memorize those terms. They're not just going to be like define this thing all on its own without context. But when we are talking about the phases of the moon, it is more than just once around the Earth. It is lined up again the way that it was at the start of the cycle. And so that's 29.5 days. We also don't need to memorize that in great detail, but knowing that it's about a month is extremely useful and important for us. And the helpful thing about this is because it's about a month and a month has about four weeks, a very easy rule of thumb is to get from new moon to first quarter takes about a week. To get from new moon to full moon takes about two weeks. We do need to be able to have that kind of sense. We don't need to be correct down to a portion of a day, but we do need to kind of have an overall sense of how long all this is taking. The sidereal month, we're not going to see that term ever again in our curriculum. It is 27.3 days. If you're curious, we don't need to memorize that number. The other thing worth pointing out at the bottom of this um, same picture is showing what we would see from Earth on each of those snapshots, where we go from new moon to first quarter to full moon to last quarter or third quarter back to new moon again. The thing that I want to point out about this is a lot of students decide that there are eight phases and that's it. And that's not quite true. The moon is always looking different from one night to the next. And in the same way from seasons that there were four very specific days of our calendar year, the summer solstice, the fall equinox, the winter solstice and the spring equinox, there are four specific moon phase dates, new moon, first quarter, full moon, third quarter. And then all of the time in between has to be filled up with a more generalized statement. So for our calendar, the rest of the year is broken up into four seasons, summer, fall, winter, spring. And for the moon phases, the rest of that month is broken up into four descriptions, waxing crescent, waxing gibbous, waning gibbous, waning crescent, and each of those last about a week. So we need to recognize that it is more important to understand the flow of this process than to just kind of memorize the order for the sake of it. Understanding why it's going to look the way it is, even if we don't have the names immediately fresh in our minds, is going to be more important than being able to just regurgitate the names in order on a test. That's not that useful if we don't understand why they go in the order that they do. Okay. We will often see sunlight coming from the right side of our page. And when that happens, um, the earth will be lit up on the right and dark on the left. And that kind of sets the stage for us. And so I do want to make sure that we recognize that we have to define in any diagram that we create, whether we're drawing it by hand or finding it in a textbook or um, external source, we do have to define the direction of sunlight because that will determine where we draw all of these different phases. 
Whenever I create a diagram for us, I'm going to try to always put the sun on the right side of the page. I don't need to confuse us for just the sake of it. So I'll be as consistent as I can. But if we find external resources, they might have a different um, default. But what I want to make sure we understand is that once we've defined where the sun is, we can start to think about time of day. Because time of day is based on when we are standing on Earth somewhere, where is the sun in our sky or below our horizon? So if we look at the internal set of terms here, noon, sunset, midnight, sunrise, I want us to recognize that noon is because a person standing right on that spot, right on that spot on Earth, is going to be facing the sun, and so they're going to be seeing the sun highest in the sky. Because we've been told the rotation of Earth is counterclockwise here, as the Earth spins, this person is still standing on the Earth, and at some point it goes from daytime to nighttime. That is, by definition, sunset. So sunset is up here in the set of times because we're going from daytime to nighttime. We don't want to think of this like the face of a clock. That is not the same thing. We are looking at where the sun is and whether it's in our view or not. As we continue to rotate, we get to midnight because midnight is as far as we're going to get from seeing the sun. The sun is as far below our horizon as it's going to be. And so this person is right in the middle of their nighttime. As we rotate more and more, we eventually get to the place where it goes from dark to light, where it goes from nighttime to day, and that would be, by definition, sunrise. And then we go through again. The reason why we want to make sure we understand that is because when we put these um, moons in a diagram like this, this actually helps us understand what we're able to see at any given time of day. Because if we decide that it is 9 p.m., that it's after sunset but before midnight, if we put ourselves on the Earth in that spot, then the moons in the diagram would be kind of giving us a sense of what moon phase could be high in the sky at that time of day, a waxing gibbous, and what moon phases would be impossible to see at that time of day, third quarter, for example, at a 9 p.m. date. So that's something that we'll be able to build more as we work with these things in activities and worksheets, but I do want to point it out here in the lecture slides. It's also worth noting that every time we see a diagram of the phases of the moon, they're all giving a different set of pieces of information. Some of them might seem too complicated, don't use those. Some of them might seem too simplified, don't use those. Find what works for you, but please always keep in mind that none of them are to scale. They've always got the Earth and the Moon far too close together when we are picturing what's going on. Okay, so let's start building our critical thinking skills. So on the left of our screen, we have a picture of the Moon that I took back in October 17th, 2015. What I want you to do is pause the video and think about and you can draw it out on your page, you can rewind to try to think about things, but I want you to give me an approximate date for when the second image on our slide would occur. So I will reveal the, um, the date on the next slide, but what I want us to try to do is predict within about two or three days what the image on the right, um, what date it is. Okay, so hopefully you paused for as long as you needed to. This picture on the right is October 23rd. So hopefully you got within two or three days. What I want you to do now, and some of this, especially the first one, you might have already thought to yourself or even written down, but I want you to pause the video again and think about what the name of this moon phase would be. Um, back in 2015, I was visiting Italy what phase would you have seen in Michigan on October 23rd, 2015, um, out of all of our named phases? So think about that. And then I want you to think about if you can see phases of the moon during the day. 
So pause the video and think through those. All right, so this is a gibbous shape. Hopefully we got the shape right away and that was the easier part of the name. And the fact that it's fully lit up on the right side tells us that it is a waxing gibbous shape. So the name of the phase is waxing gibbous. When I saw this moon at 7 p.m. in Italy, it was still afternoon for you here in Michigan. But as the Earth rotated and the day got later and later for you on Michigan, in Michigan, you would have seen this exact same waxing gibbous moon once it got to be about 7 p.m. your time. It would be roughly the same height in the sky. So one thing we want to make sure we recognize is everybody on Earth sees the same named phase of the moon. The only small trick, and it's never going to be a trick question that I um, have a lot of points writing on, the one thing to kind of big picture be aware of is if we live in the southern hemisphere, our kind of simple mnemonic of the right side being a waxing crescent is actually upside down um, if we're in the southern hemisphere or backwards, where they see the moon get bright from left to right um, and get dark from left to right. Don't write that down because it'll just confuse you, but it is worth considering the fact that a waxing gibbous moon is true for every single person on Earth because waxing implies that the next day it's going to be more lit up and that will be true for everybody. And then the question about if you can see phases of the moon during the day, you absolutely can. The moon is actually above the horizon during daylight for half of the month if you count up all of the hours. It's just that most of that time, when it's above the horizon during the day, it is a lot harder to notice. It is a bright thing against a bright background instead of a bright thing against a dark background. Even these two images, you can tell that the one on the left might not even catch your eye, um, but the one on the right, even if it's just out of the corner of your eye, you'll recognize, oh yeah, the moon is really bright in the sky over there. So it's less obvious, but that does not mean that the moon is solely a nighttime thing. That is a very common misconception, and it's permeated by a lot of popular media, which only ever puts the sun in the sky at nighttime, including, for example, Animal Crossing, where they get the phases of the moon very accurate, um, but they have the moon rise at sunset every single time, and that is not the case. If you want a um, kind of core set of information that will help you. This is probably the most key piece of um, information that can help you figure out really any time of day based on these key parts. So let me take a step back and make sure we understand what I mean by that. First of all, we see these rise times change. The moon rises based on its phase, not always at the same time of day. Because the new moon and the sun are in the same direction of our sky, they will rise and set in the same way as each other. Because the full moon and the sun are looking in opposite directions on our sky, when one is rising, the other is setting, and vice versa. A first quarter moon will be highest in the sky at sunset because when we see it high in the southern sky, the part that's lit up, the right side, is pointing towards the west, where the sun has just set. Um, and that's something that we can also start to build into our understanding as we work on activities and um, worksheets on this. So this slide, slide 54, might be worth um, copying into your notes or printing out or just saving um, from the posted slides later on. But I wanted to make sure we, we had it here to think about. Okay. So, some questions for us to see how things are going in this topic. So, a pause and think question first. Where would we look to see the full moon when it rises? Okay. This is something that is really fundamental that we need to recognize. If we have gotten it wrong, then we really are missing something very fundamental about what it means to rise and set. When the sun rises and sets, 
it is because the earth is rotating and the sun is put into view and it leaves our view. If stars rise and set, constellations along the ecliptic, for example, when they rise and set, it's because the earth is rotating and putting them into view. When the moon rises and sets, it's because the earth is rotating, which means that anything when it is rising, we will look in the general eastern direction. We know that the sun is sometimes in the northeast in the summer or southeast in the winter. The moon is also going to vary, but we can always look east. So option two here is the correct one. Then the second question, where we would look to see when the sun, uh, where we would look to see the sun when the full moon is rising, that now makes us realize, okay, the full moon rises at sunset, so the sun would be setting on the western horizon, option three here. It's a lot of critical thinking, and I need us to be aware that it is fine for us to draw stuff out to answer these kinds of questions. That is a good thing. That is using the skills appropriately. We don't want to try to have it all memorized and then be disappointed if it doesn't immediately jump out of our brains. That's not how science is supposed to work. Okay, a tougher question for us. Which set of moon phases could be seen above the horizon at 3 p.m.? So pause the video to think through this one. There's a lot of thinking, and I really do want you to have a chance to try it before I give you the answer. So pause the video. Okay, so here's the way that, that this kind of critical thinking could work. 3 p.m. tells us where our person is going to be, and so we can block out everything that would be below that person's horizon. 3 p.m. is about halfway between noon and sunset. So I've put a block here to cover up everything that is not visible to our um, person at 3 p.m. So if we look at option one here, first quarter's okay, full moon, we throw that one out. Full moon is not visible at 3 p.m. Option two, waning crescent, it would be just barely visible. A waning crescent would be kind of setting at 3 p.m. Waxing gibbous, also just visible. A waxing gibbous would be rising at 3 p.m. But a third quarter moon, definitely not visible. So option two, we have to throw out also. Okay, option three. Waxing crescent, that would be very high in the sky at 3 p.m. If we look at our little person, the waxing crescent is directly overhead in the two-dimensional diagram, which means that it would be highest in the sky. So waxing crescent is good. Waning gibbous, however, and full moon are both out of our view. So option three is also wrong. So we hope that option four is okay. Waxing crescent is really high in the sky. Waning crescent, that is just about to set, but it's good. And waxing gibbous, that is just rising, that is also good. So option four here is the correct one. All right. Note that that took more than just, obviously it's number four. There's no obvious about it. Drawing stuff out is always going to be the right way to go. I would never want us to feel bad if it's initially confusing, but then we figure it out. It really is meant to be kind of like a puzzle because that means our gears are turning in our head. The last thing I want to note here um, before we really wrap this up is when we see the moon in the sky. So let's say that we're facing south and we see the moon in the sky. In order to figure out approximately what time of day it is, we need to recognize that our clocks are based on the sun and not the moon. What we are seeing is a moon that has already risen and is not yet really high in the sky, but the fact that we see it lit up in this way tells us that what we're looking at is a waning gibbous moon. If we were thinking about the sun, where the sun would be, the sun would be exactly opposite if this were a full moon, and because it's not quite a full moon, we would shift the sun a little bit in the direction of where it's lit up. And so the sun is going to be about um, as far below the horizon as it can get. This would be roughly midnight, give or take an hour or two. We're just trying to get an approximate sense. 
these kinds of questions are the ones that we're going to see in activities and worksheets to really push our understanding. I want to recognize that this is not an easy question, but it is one that actually tells us if we understand what's going on instead of just memorizing stuff. Let's try this one. What we are seeing is a moon in the exact same spot as before, but now what we're seeing is a small crescent lit up on the right side, so we're seeing a waxing crescent moon. This is very nearly a new moon, and so the sun, if this were a new moon, would be almost exactly in the same spot, and because it isn't, it would shift to be able to light up the correct side, and so the sun would be a little bit to the right of the moon, which means it's roughly on that um, due south line, and so it would be roughly noon for this particular waxing crescent moon as we've seen it. So this previous moon, based on its phase and where it is in the sky, it's about midnight. And this moon, same exact part of the sky, but because it's a drastically different phase, this is now noon that we're looking at. We'll see more of these um, in our follow-up activities. Okay, so to wrap up, I have a few questions about that Earthrise photo that we saw before. First of all, what Earth phase is shown in the photo? Now that we have a better understanding of the terms that we would use, what shape are we seeing and what side of the Earth is lit up right now? Okay, hopefully we said gibbous. The shape is one that we can recognize from our options um, for terms. Remember that whole North Hemisphere, South Hemisphere, it might not actually be a waxing gibbous, but um, if we say it's a waxing gibbous, one thing that's kind of fun that we might not have otherwise thought about is the moon phase is going to be exactly the opposite of the Earth phase. So if this is a waxing gibbous, the moon that day would have been a waning crescent for the people looking back at the moon on that particular date in 1968. So kind of cool. As a reminder, this is the image that we had on one of the first few slides of this um, somewhat longer lecture video. Hopefully we understand it, and as a reminder, there is that deeper look video that walks us through how to build this from scratch. And as always, I wanna make sure we recognize that we will have follow-up activities, more so in this section than a lot of the others, that will help us build that critical thinking skill that we need. So I will see you in the next lecture video.